Good evening, everyone. We're just waiting for people to join in. So we've got a good group today, which is fantastic. Okay. Tell me, so come on, raise your right hand and recite the tenets. So jump, courtesy, integrity, perseverance, self-control, indomitable spirit. And the student note, the so, I shall observe the tenets of Taekwondo. I shall respect the instructor and seniors. I shall never misuse Taekwondo. I shall be a champion of freedom and justice. I shall build a more peaceful world. Model, okay, just come forward for a bit. In Tuesday's class, well, actually, to start with, remember, I've worked through with Master McPhail a way of doing a grading for, uh, for our yellow belts and above. Uh, so I'll be arranging for a date soon. And I'll let everybody know when that date is. So keep your eye out for that. For the grading, we will cover everything. So even though we're constrained by space, if you have got a bigger space outside and you can train outside, great. If you're constrained by space, we can work with that. That's no problem. We'll be working through, of course, your fundamental movements. We'll be working through your patterns, uh, doing them just the way that we've been doing them in class. If you don't have space, we do good, strong movements, then adjust your body position, then do the next movement. Step sparring, if you have a suitable taekwondo partner at home, you can do it with your partner. If you don't, you'll just be doing it alone. And I expect to see good execution, good focus, um, good strong power, nice technique, those sorts of things. For free sparring, we'll be working through all of the drills that we've been working on. I'll expect you to be able to demonstrate a lot of those drills. You might do some partner work with, uh, sorry, some work with a chair or something like that so you can see your footwork and things moving around an obstacle. Uh, and if you do have a partner at home, then we might be free sparring with your partner at home if you're a suitable partner. Okay, so if it's a big height mismatch or something like that, I'll be happy just to look at your drills and to see how you're going with those. The one thing that I will want you all to arrange a partner for is your self-defense. So that could be a, an adult or someone at home or a sibling, preferably somebody that's a little bit bigger than you rather than a little bit smaller than you. Okay, somebody that's a little bit stronger, ideally. So um, make sure that person's available for classes over the next few weeks so you can practice your self-defense stuff. We'll start working gently with that person and then we'll increase intensity as your partner gets more comfortable. Okay, because we don't want anybody getting hurt doing this stuff. So get that underway. Uh, today, I just want to, as on Tuesday, if anyone who missed it, make sure you go through and look through Tuesday's class, uh, because we did some work on the first stage of self-defense, on the avoid stage, uh, and today we're going to work through some of the key things of the de-escalate stage. Most of you by now, I believe, have the self-defense handbook, so you should be reading it, because for grading, I will be testing this content and expect you to know it. That'll be part of your self-defense requirements for grading. So um, the avoid stuff, as we say, there were the, the four areas that we covered off on Tuesday, the traffic light system, survival assumptions, secondary locations, and personal safety. Always keep in mind, remember that you should be trusting your instincts. That's one of the key things you're going to do, do to avoid a bad situation. Then today, we're going to be working through the de-escalation de stage. So if your avoid methods fail and you end up face-to-face -face in a confrontation, the first thing you want to try and do is talk your way out of it without physical altercation. It's the much safest way to go. You're less likely to get hurt, less likely to get yourself in trouble. So these are the key things that we're trying to work on. 
the five areas that you'll need to know about the de-escalation phase. And this does take practice, by the way, which is why sometimes we practice this in class. First one is you have to know the difference between an ego attack and a criminal attack. Second one is for ego-based attacks, you want to practice the four things that you do not say when you're trying to de-escalate a situation. So on an ego-based attack, there are four ego fuels you avoid saying. The third thing, and this is more for your criminal-based attacks, there are three things that your aggressors may want. You want to know those things. And then three things that your criminal aggressor does not want. So you want to know those three things as well. And the last part of de-escalation is understanding the, the points about the passive stance that we work with and the psychology behind it. So working through those briefly, firstly, the ego attack and a criminal attack. An ego attack is where it's fueled by pride and ego, where you kind of got into a bit of a heated debate or an argument or somebody's threatening you for some reason because they want to look good in front of their peers. That's an ego-based attack. A criminal attack is where they're motivated by something where they want something from you. It could be a robbery or an assault or um, a sexual assault or any of those sorts of things, right? So an ego attack is when they're trying to do something to pump themselves up to make themselves look good or feel stronger. And a criminal-based attack is when they're deliberately coming after something that you have. For an ego-based attack, there are four, as you should know, four different types of things you avoid saying when you're de-escalating. The first one is you don't challenge them. So if somebody comes up and says something, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're um, aggressive in front of your face, if you don't say something like, what are you going to do about it? Okay, Because it's just putting ego against ego that fuels the fire and everything gets worse. Second thing, don't tell them what to do. Don't command them. And this is things that sometimes slip out, like calm down, man, or hey, back, hey relax, back off, chill out, that sort of stuff. Avoid saying things like that. You say something like relax to somebody who's angry and aggressive, they say, I am relaxed. Don't tell me to calm down. And again, it's going to make things worse. So you want to avoid saying, commanding them and telling them what to do. The third one is don't threaten them. So this is things like, uh, you know, back off or I'll call the police. Now, that's going to be stuff like, well, call the police. Let's see if they get here to save you in time. You know, so anything like that, you avoid those sorts of things that, that provide some sort of threat to them. And this can be physical posturing as well. Uh, which can come a look, you know, that or challenging, very, very similar in that case. So don't threaten the opponent. And the fourth one is don't contradict them. And this one takes a lot of practice. This one and, the, and not commanding them both take a lot of practice. So contradicting them is telling them that they're wrong. So if in an ego-based situation, quite often they'll accuse you of something. And in many cases, you may not have done it. So if they accuse you of something and you say, no, that wasn't me, that's likely to fuel the fire. So you want to avoid the instant contradiction of, no, I didn't. And you want to talk your way around that. So if somebody says, for example, hey, you just bumped my beer, say, gee, I'm sorry, man, which one was your beer? I had no idea. I, I, I'm sure I didn't um, bump into something. So you talk your way around that situation. Or you were looking at my partner. Oh, gee, I'm sorry, man, which one's your partner? I, I didn't realize that they were with you. Or I, I was actually looking at the door over there because I'm waiting for a friend to arrive. So not immediately saying no, understanding what they're after or what the problem is and then explaining your situation rather than immediately going to a no response. So there are four ego, four ego refuels, don't challenge, don't command, don't threaten, don't contradict. Then we get into the criminal stuff. The things criminals may, the, a criminal may want, your valuables, your phone, your jewels, your, your watch, your, shul, uh, your, your shoes, your, um, your money, that sort of stuff. Second thing is your body or your mind. So wanting to manipulate you in some way, wanting to physically hurt you. Uh, this includes sexual assaults, those sorts of things. And the last one is your life, where they actually want to kill you, right? So they're the three things that a criminal may want from you. The things they don't want, and these are the things that we want to give them in spades, is attention is the first. So if you're, if you're being attacked by a criminal, making lots of noise so they the thinking they're going to get seen. Second thing, they don't want to get caught. So again, by making a lot of noise, we increase the risk that they might get caught. And the third thing is they don't want to get hurt. So if it goes physical, you hurt them as much as you can. You don't threaten to hurt them. That's not a, not a good thing. Or actually, in a, a criminal-based situation, maybe it can be. Maybe that's, those, those ego fuels don't apply so much in a criminal situation. So sometimes it can be effective. 
but generally, you know, if, if you get into that physical altercation, you want to hurt them as much as possible, as quickly as possible, and, and so that they say, you're not worth the effort, and they run off and try somebody else, right? So they don't want attention, they don't want to be caught, and they don't want to be hurt. The last thing is the points around the passive stance. So this is the, the way we stand with our hands up, not looking like a threat. Firstly, the psychological message is saying that I'm not a threat here. I'm not going to hit a fight. So having your palms out towards them gives them that, that indication that you're not here to try and attack them, right? The second thing is you have a shield between you and your opponent. It maximizes the chance that you're going to flinch and block something if an attack comes in. So your hands are really close to where you need them if you need to defend yourself. The third thing is from that position, it's very easy to hit them. Your hands are very quick and straight away from this position, if you, if you immediately go out and hit like an open fist punch, you're going to hit them because you're going to be able to hit them. If you don't pull back, you just go straight forward and strike. You're going to hit them before they realize your hand is coming. The fourth thing is your hands are like a barrier. Okay, so you give it, you, it's like a fence between you and the opponent. So that's a really key reason to have it. And the last thing is anybody's watching it or the cameras that are, that are recording what you're doing, make it look like that you don't want to fight. So you've got a very clear perception that you're the victim, not the aggressor. Okay, although you're going to change that situation around significantly. So they're the five areas around de-escalation. There's some principles there about your passive stance. Of course, your eyes are up, your hands are up with your palms forward, your elbows are in, protecting your body. Your body's half facing like an L stance is. Your knees are bent a little bit to give you a little bit of mobility and you've got one leg at the back. So that's the position you're in with your passive stance. Okay, you can see it's a really confident looking position, but it's not an aggressive looking position. So there are the five areas that I need you to understand around the escalation. Ego attacks and criminal attacks, the four ego fuels, the three things the aggressors may want, the three things they do not want, and the information about the passive stance, including those five, five strong advantages of the passive stance. Any questions about that? Okay, let's get busy then. Start quickly with some joint rotations. Change direction. Elbows. Change direction, arms back, forwards, left ankle, raise your hand if you own a copy of that self-defense handbook in your household, that cool, raise your hand if you do not have a copy, change direction, if you do not have that self-defense handbook, raise it, raise your hand. Okay. So you'll need to be referring to these, um, these lessons, change foot, or I recommend that you arrange a copy of that handbook. It's very worthwhile, not just for you, but if you're at home, for other members of your family to read it as well. Change direction. I can arrange those for you. Hands on knees. Actually, on that note, I have an apology to make. I said last week there were a few of you who ordered books and I ran out. I ordered more books last Friday, but I'm apparently not going to receive them by tomorrow. So I won't be able to deliver them this week as I hoped. So they'll arrive next week and I'll deliver them to you next Friday. So my apologies to the four of you who are waiting on books. And legs outwards. That does mean for those of you who need a particular book, get on to me and order it in the next few days. And hopefully I'll have enough to deliver one of them to you before next Friday or when I come around and do the rounds next Friday. And legs inwards, assuming I don't run out again. I just ordered a bunch. There are a few people ordering. So get in early and don't miss out. And hips. Change direction. Oh, here's a little piece of trivia for you, actually, just quickly. And relax. 
from this handbook, our model in the handbook or our models here, the man in the model, uh, the, the male model there is our president, Master Peter Graham. He's based in Wellington. Uh, he's amazing. And the lady there, she's a fifth or sixth degree. That's uh, Mrs. Suzanne Patterson. That's his wife. So um, our president and his wife who run our Patoni Club. There you go. A little bit of trivia for you. Okay. From here, as we did last class, I want you to choose fundamental movements from your syllabus and practice spot technique. So choose ones that are a little bit more difficult. Do stances and hand techniques first, no kicks initially. So choose a movement from your pattern, for example, and left and right. Go. Check your crossing position, work on your three counts, hands in front of chest, cross and block. If anybody has any questions about any fundamental movements at their grade, unmute and ask me and I will help them. Yes, ma'am. You ready with a question? Oh, yes, sorry. Um, fundamental movements, those are our three ship sparrings, right? I uh, know your fundamental movements are the ones that I haven't got the uh, the senior book here because I ran out when I sold them all. Uh, but under in your handbook, they're the ones at the top your offensive and defensive movements and your stances. Ah, okay, that was cool. So they're the fundamental movements you have to know for your grade. Okay. Generally, the hand techniques and your fundamental movements come from your pattern. And then the kicks don't. They don't come from your pattern at all. They just kind of phase through the color belt braids. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. But yellow belts and green stripes have a few additional color belt um, uh, pan techniques because they use them in their three step sparring. So choose a movement from your fundamental movements from your grades. Practice left and right. Good, Alice and Rose. Just make sure you're using two hands. So extend your non blocking blocking hand out. And then when you block with your downward block, pull it back to your hip really, really quickly. From here, this way. Okay, it's good. And stopping at the height of your solar plexus. Good, Aiden, remember to look at the target. Good, Sam, remember to use your hip. Your elbow, you want to line up, have your body half facing, and then as you strike with your elbow, flick your hip in the same direction. Smashes in with, with one hand. That's it. In your pattern, you're presenting a target and hitting it. When you do the fundamental movement, the other hand should come back to your hip. So imagine you've got an opponent there, Sam, and you pull the other hand back to your hip and go bang and smash it with your elbow this way. That's it, but always the reverse, Sam. Opposite hand and leg. Left leg forward, strike with my right hand, and vice versa. Um, sir? Yeah. yeah. How high should the crescent kick be? Like. That's a good question. It should be as high as the attack. So generally, it's about the height of your solar plexus. But if you've got good strength and flexibility, it might be higher. So okay. just like, but generally, it'll be about the height of your solar plexus to your shoulder line, or your shoulder height, rather. And why is your foot twisting the other way? Oh, sorry, I'm doing a hooking kick. You're doing a crescent kick. Crescent kick comes in with this one. Okay. So yes, your kick is this way. It's the blue stripe kick that goes the other way that I was doing before. I apologize. So from here, this way. Okay, thank you. Cool. No problem. If you can, try and stop it about the height of your solar plexus. So you go above your solar plexus and then block downwards slightly and stop at your solar plexus briefly. Elijah, nice. Try and get a little bit more hip. So from here with your double forearm block, rather than having my hips almost forward here and using just mainly my arms, if I turn my hips a little bit more sideways, just half facing here, I can then throw my hip into it as I finish my movement. And I'll get a lot more power from that last little bit of hip. And that applies to all your movements. Cool, good. Try a different movement. Makai, just watch that you've got your weight on your back leg if you're in L stance. If you're in fixed stance, then you'll be in the middle. So just make sure that you are consciously in L stance or fixed stance.
Kate, what are you working on here? Let me have a look. No, don't have to tell me, just do it. Unless you've got questions. Okay, keep your eyes up, Kate. Keep your eyes up. Uh, Kate, your right hand, your right hand looks to be thrusting and your left hand looks to be striking. So which one are you after? You're doing the knife hand side strike or the flat finger to thrust? Uh, the thrust, sir. The thrust, okay, it. cool. So thrust works just like a punch. Cool. I think it's just this camera speed that I couldn't quite see whether you were crossing or not. Rose, that looks good. Uh, question again, I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. Um, palm downward block. When I do the when I do the block, it's from here. Is it first a punch and then a block down? It's just extending your arm. It's not a punch, it's just reaction force. So I extend my other hand out so that I can pull it back to my hip for power. So I'm just okay. extending it forward and then boom, I pull it back when I block. That's all. Also, when I do the block, um, is the hand over here or is it like a little bit bent? Good question. It's chest line. So it's in line with your badge because my body's half facing. Okay, so I'm on a, on a slight, so like I'm doing my low block and my low block's in line with my badge, it's the same kind of position. In line with my badge, but solar fix is high. Does that answer your question? So where my low block is blocking into in line with my badge. So my thumb's actually in line with my tummy, really. And then from here, if I lift it up and open my hand at solar plexus, that's the hot, that's the line of my palm downward block. So it's not in line with my center, it's in line with my badge, the blocking in line with my badge. Yeah, and is the elbow out or like just ah good question? Sorry, yes, the elbow can be it's very slightly lower than the hand, but not much lower. It's almost flat, but just slightly slight, very slight. So a little bit more flat than that. Lift your elbow slightly more. Yeah, there we go. Now just lower it down so it's the height of your solar plexus. You look like might be camera angle, but you look like you're a bit too high. So it should be here, solar plexus height. Good. Yep, that's it. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Sorry. No Connor, with your son, Paul McMarkey, just make sure this front arm is bent. Same with your forearm guarding block. So don't have your arm a little bit too straight or you haven't got much blocking surface. So I'm blocking with this forearm. If I bend my arm a little bit more, I get a bigger blocking surface. Knuckles are shoulder height and then elbow down. Does that make sense? Try another movement, guys. That's it. And, the, and your guarding blocks, Connor, your other hand is in line with your opposite badge. So it comes across protecting your whole body this way. Forearm block or knife hand block. But Aiden, just make sure that forearm is over your head. Be careful that it's not your fist over your head. Make sure your forearm is over your head. Kate, not quite so wide with your wedging block. Just finish about shoulder width here. Yeah, I'm um, so, sorry, a question about that. What's the blocking? How do, ah, that'll, how help, do you... that'll help a lot. If someone's coming in to grab you. So imagine, for example, with a high block that you do in Dosan, but they might be coming to grab your throat. You boom and you block out this way. So you cross your hands in front of you when they're coming in this way and you explode outward and stop about the line. Of, so just stop in line with your shoulders here. Don't stop past your shoulders. Just stop here with the line of the shoulders. So a high block looks like that. My elbows, you can see, are slightly wider than my fists. So not, not like this, not like this. Just slightly wider like that. Now, here's a little technical thing for you. When you do a middle block, it can be here, or I can use my inner form and it goes out the other way. But for a high block, which is what you're doing in Dosan, here. So not quite so wide, a little bit narrower. Fists in line with your shoulders. That's it. That's it. That looks good. So imagine someone coming in to grab you and you just go boom and block. Okay. Thank you, sir. Cool. You're welcome. Okay. Oh. And like, you just watch that top hand with your sun palm up, Maki, or your sun song gun, Maki. Make sure it's not too flat. Get your elbow down a little bit. Just lift your hand up a little bit, Elijah. That's it. Yes. Lovely. Not quite so far. Just about a fist from your head. Is about a fist gap from here to your head. Good, cool. That gives you see that little angle now. 
Your little angle rather than being flat, it's like this. Good. Uh, so what's the upset fingertip thruster? Ah, that's a cool one. From here, you, this is a flat fingertip thrust. This is a straight fingertip thrust that you do in Dangun. Ah, uh, sorry, Dosan. And an upset fingertip thrust is this way, going for the lower abdomen. It starts with your elbows down and your palms forward. And then from here, it turns palm up. Your other hand usually comes to your shoulder, like it does in the knife hand inward strike in, in Wanyo. From here, it thrusts forward this way, and you stick your fingertips into the squishy bits. Thank you. You're welcome. I think that's a red strike technique. Yeah, I was reading the wrong syllabus. Oh, it's cool though. So it's worth practicing. It's really love. It works very well in self defense too. Oh, it's really great. Uh, okay, move on to your kicks, guys. Yes, ma'am. Uh, it's actually about the kicks. Um, oh. A reverse turning kick. Um, am I kicking in, like the person in front of me, or is it like more to an angle? Could you repeat the question for me? It's reverse turning kick and also reverse hooking kick. Yes. Am I Am I kicking the person in front of me or is the person more ah, to an end? Right. Sorry, yeah, the sound just cut out there for a moment. Okay, so reverse hook and kick and reverse turn and kick are designed for an opponent 45 degrees behind you. So if I'm standing up normally, front snap kick, front kicks are designed here, turn and kick is designed on an angle this way, reverse turn and kick and reverse hook and kick are designed for an angle behind me. Okay. So, but generally, when we do them from an L stance, this is our side and this is our side. So generally we do them here. Okay, we can do them over here and some of the patterns, particularly when you get to secondary black belt, some of the patterns you kick and stop here with reverse turning kicks. But if you're doing your front leg, we tend to lean and do it this way from here. And when we're doing the rear leg, we tend to spin and do it for someone who's directly here as well. Okay, so if the answer is it depends on where your opponent is. When we're doing it in line work, we generally do it to somebody who's standing directly what, what you think of as in front of you. Uh, and if you're standing in a parallel stance, then it's designed for 45 degrees behind. So does that answer the question? Yeah, it does. So for green belt, am I practicing just the one where the person's in front of me? Uh, know them all, but generally you a lot of practice on this one, yes. Front leg and back leg. Yeah, okay. and from that you can do it anywhere, it doesn't matter. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Other questions about fundamental kicks? So Cohen, you've now got, um, as well as having turning kick, because you're a star, you've got turning kick this way, okay, that one that's at a 45 degree angle. You've got side rising kick this way, but you also have side turning kick, which comes all the way around here, and side piercing kick. That stamping motion. So you've got four new fundamentals. Oh, you've also got, sorry, side front snap kick. The front leg kicking this way. So you've got five kicks to learn, which many of them you've done already. So you're doing well. Sam, relax and start from your guarding blocks. So start from your guarding block, lift up and really drive it down. Feel the kick, feel it working. Sorry, sir, yes. Uh, with the chicken kicks, what's the angle of the uh, supporting foot? Uh, for side chicken kick or front chicken kick? Um, both. Side chicken kick, it keeps facing forwards. This so. one, it's quite an unusual one. Front chicken kick, you, it'll turn a little bit, but not too much. All right, thank you, sir. You're welcome. Uh, so I just have a question about back piercing kick. Excellent, yes. I was just wondering what height is it? What ah, height do we do that? Good question. It, has, it varies depending on where the target is. Mm -hmm. So it can be low, middle, or high, being solo, um, navel, navel height, shoulder height, or eye height. So all of those are appropriate. You, generally, we're a bit lazy in class and we say back piercing kick, go. Uh, you might might have noticed sometimes that I try and get a bit more specific and say middle back piercing and kick, do it at shoulder height or high kick. So they can be all three. Uh, but the key thing is you'll need to hunch over and lean in order to be able to get your kick up to any of those heights. But try and lift it up to your shoulder height as a standard. Okay, this way. 
Okay. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Change kicks if you haven't already. Um, sir. Yes, ma'am. Sorry, I remember in one of our classes, Mr. Master. Um, Dr. Wallace? Yeah, Master V, I think. Uh, he showed me how to do the turning, the one that you showed us. He showed me a few like seconds ago, and um, I just forgot which it's part of my body. Turning kick, the turning kick, the reverse turning kick, or the reverse hooking kick. Uh, <laughs> um, reverse turning kick. Reverse turning kick. Yeah, but yeah, but you're going around. Okay, so when you spin, you use your back leg, generally. You're spinning towards your front. Then from here, you look over your shoulder, stick your bum out, lift the leg up, and then pull it across, keeping that back hand by your jaw. Okay, so you're kind of winding up your corkscrew and then releasing the power. Okay, so the first thing on my body that is turning is my leg. Your hips and shoulders. Okay hips and shoulders, and then your leg comes last. Okay, thank you. Because right I now, keep losing balance. Like, the what key am I doing thing with this kick is it's this motion. It's very much like a downward kick. Where people make mistakes with reverse turning kick is they'll lead with their leg, and there's nowhere for it to go except to hook. Right, So the, the body's in a straight line already, and they're not getting anywhere. You have to fold your body up like this, and then straighten your leg out. But you're doing that sideways. It's all so from here. When I lift my bum out, stick my bum out and pull my leg up, I'm folding my body over. And then from here, I can pull my leg around. So I'm doing this shape sideways. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, that helps. Cool. Thank you. Okay. One more minute. Excuse me, sir, but um, what is a vertical kick? Good question. A vertical kick is an attack where your foot is straight up and down, your foot is vertical, and it can either come inward or it can go outward, okay? So I bring my leg up bent and I open my hips out this way, and then I pull it across in front of me and straighten my leg and then bend it again. Okay, that's a vertical kick inward this way. Very, very fast kick. Keep your hands up, guard your brain. That's it, bring your, bring your knee up first, and then straighten your leg as you kick across and bend it again. You're striking with your reverse foot sword, this part here. Now an outward vertical kick is kind of the opposite. If I use my front leg, I bring it up in front of my body with my knee bent, and then straighten my leg up, pull it across and bend it again. So no, but notice for this one, my body is up and down. I don't lean like I do a reverse hooking kick. So that looks like, don't lean like a reverse hooking kick. Keep your body straight up and your foot straight up. It's actually really easy. Your foot's on an angle. Don't go this way. Keep the foot that's on the ground pointing to me. Keep the foot that's on the ground pointing straight to me so your foot can stay straight up in the air. Don't angle your foot. Now, if I use my rear leg, I spin. But at the moment of the kick, my supporting foot's pointing straight ahead so that my body is straight up and down and my foot is straight up and down, not on an angle. Does that make sense? With my front leg, this way. So maybe you're slapping someone across the face. You're using your foot sword for the outward kick and your reverse foot sword for the inward kick. Okay? Cool. And go on, everyone grab a drink.
Okay, tonight we're gonna to work through two patterns. You'll do your own pattern and we'll all do dosan. Yellow belts and below, I want you to practice the pattern you know. So if you're yellow stripe, you'll do chonji. If you're yellow belt, in fact, Cohen, you can do chonji and dangun. That's the two patterns, okay? Green stripes and above, we're gonna be doing dosan first. Okay, dosan's got 24 movements, of course, and that represents the 24 hours in a day which is the life of Dosan that he devoted to furthering the, the education of Korea and its independence movement. Most of which he actually did from the US. He lived in, I think, Los Angeles or something for, most, for a lot, large portion of his life. Okay, so the first, uh, so let's get up and do it together. I'll do it with my back to you and just describe what I'm doing, which means I won't be able to tell you where you're going wrong and doing feedback. I'll be demonstrating a little bit more. So just listen to what I'm saying and try and apply what I'm saying. Dos ante, the parallel already starts. So white belts and uh, yellow belts and below, chonji if you know it, or sajumaki both sides if you don't. First movement, step your left foot to the left, make sure you leave room for your hips to make a good walking stance. Cross on top, smashing two watches together, forearm side, high side block, go. This is eye level, locks at eye level, Keep your elbow in. Now from here on the spot, your full sine wave, because it's normal speed. As you drop down into your sine wave, you'll change to full facing, because you're half facing with this block at eye level. Change to full facing as you go down, pull back, and reverse punch. Go. So I've still got my left foot in the front. Now my spot turn, moving my front foot onto the center line. My front foot, my midline, think of my midline in, in the, between my two feet, and then the line across behind my front heel. I'm gonna bring my left foot and step on that cross. When I step on that cross, my body's still fundamentally facing forwards. I haven't turned yet. It's got about half facing position here. Then as I put my foot on the ground, that's when I pivot and block the other side, go. Cross on top, that's it. Locking eye level, chest line with your block, elbow in. Then normal speed from here, change to full facing as you go down, reverse punch, go. Really nice one for hip power. The pattern diagram here is like a, a Z shape. So my front foot is on my CD line. So I bring my back foot forward, and then step out with my left foot to make an eye pain guarding block. And now I'll start. Fingertips at shoulder height. Make sure you're protecting your body, body weight back on your back leg, 70% of the back leg. Check your stance is not too wide. Your front toe should be on the same line as your back heel, which gives you about two and a half centimeters between your heels. Stepping forward, open your hands out, loose fists here. And then my left hand will block downward with a palm downward block. And my right hand thrusts over the top, uh, straight fingers at thrust, full facing thrust to your center line. Finish your walking stance. Don't move ahead to movement seven. Finish movement six first. Strong walking stance. Now from here, someone has grabbed my hand. I'm gonna pivot on my feet. Don't bring your feet too close together. I'll demonstrate this here. Someone has grabbed me and is pulling me back this way. If I do this, they will pull me over. I have to resist being pulled. So from here, this way, I drop my body weight a little bit, bend my legs, and my front, my back foot only really pivots and comes in a couple of centimeters, very small. And as I do that, I turn my palm down. So that's it. That's my release, okay? I can complete that then from that position, open my hands up, turn all the way around, cross underneath, back for side strike. This is a, an attack, not a defense. So from my release here, open my hands, cross strike. Eye level, back fist out. Don't turn your hand too far so only one knuckle is touching. Your first two knuckles make contact. Then cross underneath, other hand, back for side strike. Check that your elbow is not outwards like this. I can't hit anything with my knuckles. 
My elbow has to be in. Shoulder line here. Not chest line like a block, shoulder line for the attack. Okay, now from here, pivot around my front foot, stepping off my CD line. Do the block again, it crosses on top. I've now got that angle on my arm again, I'm chest line, eye level. Then from here, reverse punch. Punch center line, hips and shoulders straight. Again, my front foot comes onto that line behind my heel and my midline. Still facing fundamentally straight ahead. Little bit of an angle, half facing. And once my foot touches the ground, that's when I pivot and block. Go. My eye level. Now from here on the spot, reverse punch, go. Good. Now my front foot is back on my CD line. So I have to bring my back foot to my CD line. I step out on a slight angle and make my wedge and block. So my front foot's on a slight angle from my back foot. We'll find out how much angle in just a moment. Wedging block, my fists to the width of my shoulders. And my elbows are slightly outside that. Not too wide here, just here. Eye level with my knuckles. Middle front snap kick, solar plexus height. And then land and do a full punch. Then push straight up off the ground and do a second punch. It's two punches in fast motion. Make sure you plant your heel after the first punch. Then lift it and drop back down for the second punch. After I've done my second punch, I'm in a walking stance, full facing, but my two feet are on the same direction line as CD. So my feet are actually on the same line this way, but my walking stance is facing this way. That's how I get my angle correct. Okay, right foot moves over the other side. Middle kick, two fast motion punches. You're not quite on the same line this way, but it's pretty similar. Full facing with your reverse punch. Now the left foot comes back to your CD line facing forward, chukimaki. Make sure your forearm is over your head. Make sure you have a slight angle on your forearm. Okay, don't, don't lift your elbow up so your forearm's flat like this. It's got an angle in it. And again, other chukimaki. Your front foot is now on your AB line when you started. So I pivot around my front foot, knife hand side strike. Sitting stance this time, make sure you open your knees and sit. Then step together. And from here, as I land with this foot, I change my body weight from my right foot to my left foot. That's where I make sine wave. One, two. In doing so, my foot will naturally arc a little bit. I'll do it sideways. So it's not going straight across like this. It will naturally arc out of it because of my sine wave. Okay, from here, it naturally arcs forward and out again. So from here, what's up? And right leg back in, bottle. Okay, everybody, you'll sign in your own time. To beat, wipe out, sport action, punch both sides, yellow stripes, Chonji, Cohen, Chonji. Ready? She jump. Don't rush one and two, their normal speed. Center line for your straight fingertip thrust. Then release. After your back fists, when you turn, you're doing a block again. Make sure you do middle kicks.
For your knife hand side strike, make sure you cross in front of your opposite chest. So from here, I can strike across this way, opposite chest. Both hands have to work. Don't cross too far over so this hand's not doing anything. Just in front of your opposite chest, in front of the badge. Come on, butt all. Okay, now everybody perform your own pattern. Cold, if you know done good, you can practice done good. Do you know done good? Okay, do you know Chonji? Are you ready to start done good? You are? Okay, I'll do done good with you. Everybody else, your own pattern. Me. I'll give you the first eight movements. Colin. Chi jump. So from your parallel when he starts, Colin. Hands in front of my chest, my left foot steps to the left in an L stance, and do that knife hand guarding block we've been practicing. So bend this elbow, fingertip at shoulder height, other hand protects my body. Now, all of the punches in this pattern are eye level. In Chonji, they're all shoulder height. And Dangun, they're all eye level. So walking stance, high punch. Now we're going to do that backward step turn again. So I'm going to follow my right hand all the way around. Knife hand guarding block. And then do a high punch. Okay, let's do number one to four again. Let's do those four. Ready? And one. And two. Three. Four. Now the left foot steps towards the front, towards me. Do a forearm low block. And walking starts. That's it. Now we're going to do three high punches moving forwards. One. I'll be able to adjust space. Two. Three. Okay, that's the first eight movements. Remember those punches are center line? Okay, from here. One. Two, three, come on, Jack. Four, low block, five, six, seven, eight. Cool, that's the first eight. Remember, all those punches are eye level. And come on, butt all. Okay, once more with your own pattern, should be. This time I'm going to watch. Ready. She jump. Alice, make sure you move your foot from here. There we go. Yep. Good. Come back to the middle before you do your side kick. Eye level with those, Kate. The wedging block is eye level. That's it. Middle kick and two punches. Make sure that forearm's over your head, Kate, with your chukumaki, rather than your hand. Make sure you pull it across through that. Blue it. There we go. That's it. Good. Don't lift your elbow too high like this so it's flat. Let it be on an angle a bit. Good. Yes, that's it. Anev, lift your knee for your side kick. Lift that knee up nice and high. Sam, don't rush. Finish your walking stance for your sung pomak maki. Ah, uh, sorry, for your dual pomak maki. Double forearm block. Check your walking stance. Lock that back leg straight. Zach, don't rush. Remember, finish each movement, then do the next one. Don't bounce from one straight to the next. Finish it, then go. Next one. Do a first few movements for me, Zach. That's it. Ah, uh, go back to the last movement there, Zach. Go back to that that punch, the reverse punch. Your left foot, other hands, change hands. Feet are good, change hands. Now your left foot comes forward to do that guarding block, not your right foot coming back. No, 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 change. You were good. Put your left, your right foot in the front. Now to do your guarding block, go forward and then towards me. Not back. Yes, that way. That way. That's it. For the knife hand guarding block. Then your thrust. You were doing dosan, Zach. You changed patterns. That's why I had you make change your feet. 
If you're doing one row, you come back to the center. So, yes, sir. Uh, with the turning kicks, I forgot, is it straight ahead or is it at 45 degrees? Uh, for Huarang, yes, it's sir. actually about 15 degrees. Okay, thank you, sir. No problem. Uh, Arnab, just make sure you reach over the top with that front hand. Aiden, are you doing Chonji or Dangun? One finger for Chonji, two fingers for Dangun. Two, okay. All of the punches in Dangun are eye level. You're a little bit low with that last punch. Make sure it's eye. Right, that's it. Good. And come on, butt off. You got any questions? Come and ask. Remember your pattern diagrams, guys. So, Zach, sorry I confused you a little bit there, but you, I thought you'd gone from Dosan to Dangun. Dosan, remember, it's that Z shape with your feet. So, you go left foot, punch, spot turn, punch, come forward, because this is my center line. Just like we practiced before, then my thrust and release and so forth, because I'm making a Z shape. But one yo is a capital I shape. So, with one yo, as you were doing, out this side, come back to the middle, out to this side, come back to the middle to get my capital I shape. Okay, so make sure you know the diagram so you know which foot to move. Okay, and come on. Now, those of you who've got a partner, get your partner. Those of you who haven't, you're gonna work by yourselves. I told you in the last couple of classes that I want you using the self-defense handbook to memorize your required syllabus. So I want you to show me now that you know those fundamental movements from the syllabus, the, the defenses. Anyone who does not know their basic attacks and defenses for their grade, come forward and raise your hand. Everyone who does, get practicing. If you're alone, just work through it as if you had a partner. Uh, so, hey, as I said last class, I know some of them, but I just had a classics exam today that I had to study for, so it's, I haven't had the chance to refresh. Okay, I'll show you briefly the red belt ones. Oh, I've got the book here, so. Oh, cool. Have a quick look through. Yeah. Anyone's got any questions about their syllabus? Remember, yellow belts is grabs to the wrists and the arms. Green belts is grabbed to the body from the front. Blue belts are grabs to the body from behind. Red belts are physical attacks, punches and kicks and so forth. White belts do the yellow belt one. So you do the wrist releases or the arm releases. Okay, where you go. I want to see it demonstrated. See a lot of people not doing anything. You'll need to demonstrate this for grading. So get started now. Alice and Rose, do you know yours? Okay, up again, get it done. Just be careful with each other inside. I don't want you to break any paintings or anything. So just go about 70% 70, 70 power rather than doing 100%. Sam, just do it. If you haven't got a partner with you, just imagine you've got a partner and do it as if you've got a partner. So for example, if I'm doing the lapel grab from here, my hands will be up or trap and block, strike down on this blocking hand. Then I might come in and hit the face from this position and then whatever I'm going to do to finish from that. So if I'm doing B level, I might grab behind the head, pop it a knee, then smash it with my other elbow. All right. So I want you to think about what you're doing. If it's an A level technique from here, one, two, back off, man, leave me alone. Okay. Let's go. I have same thing. Imagine what the attack is. But for grading, I expect you to have a partner. So make sure you're working with someone at home. Oh, I love it. The GS family's got the whole family involved. That's superb. So it seems like a lot of these are very much similar. Just get off the line and push them. Is that? Yeah. Yep. Is that? Yeah. That's good. 
except you know, with a haymaker, for example, you won't want to be going towards the punch when you move off the line, you want to go away from it. It's really important or straight in. So some of them you can go straight in. The straight punch, you don't really want to go straight in. You've got to go off the line because you're walking into the punch. The haymaker, you can go straight in or go off the line slightly. Uh, the, the hooks and the uppercuts are, are really, really, they're actually probably the hardest ones to do. They're very close. So a lot of that can be around getting space and then following up because uh, there's no real magic bullets with the punches coming up on the inside. Um, but yeah, things like the straight kick and stuff like that can be off the line. Your, your tackle, your body tackle, that's actually not so much off the line. It tends to be straight back. Okay, so because it, it's, you know, someone's rushing at you and you just kind of spray your legs and go backwards and lean on top of them. So you're gonna, and then you can from here shift off to the side. So yeah, right, make, you, make it that way. Okay, Sam, we've got some work to do for you, young man. What I, one of the cool things about doing this with mum and dad is that mum and dad should get the feel from you doing this that you can make it work, okay? So at the, at the start, mum and dad might grab you a little bit gently, but then as you get a little bit better, they might grab you a little bit more firmly and say, now get out of this. Mums and dads, be careful because, you know, once they know what they're doing and they can, we don't want to make sure they're not hurting you. But you want to be confident that it's working. So if you're working with your child on this and they're just doing something, oh, yeah, cool, that's a great exercise, it's not working. If you're thinking, wow, my son can actually do this, this is actually going to get him out of a grab. That's what we need, right? This is practical self-defense and it has to feel like it's going to work. Now, remember, so... Uh, keep, keep working as I'm talking to guys. Keep practicing. We have A level and B level. And that's the level of, of um, kind of violence that you're using in your counterattack. So if it's a low violence attack, you don't need to knock them out and have three teeth scattered around the floor around them, right? So it's low level responses. B level is at the other extreme. And you need to be able to do both. Sam, for the two hand grab there, let's work with you on that one. So when mum's grabbing your two hands, first thing, if someone's grabbing both your hands, don't try and release them both at the same time because it leaves you vulnerable. Forget about stamping on the foot and stuff like that. Just grab your own hand, step back and wrench your hand out. If they've still got the other hand, grab the other hand and wrench it out and get your hands up. So grab your own hand, turn your palm towards the ground. That'll happen naturally. So from here, I'm going to go like this grab my own hand, step back into a strong stance like an L stance and drive my hips and leave my way out of that grab. And if they've still got your other hand, try the other hand, do the same thing. There we go. Now, as you get better at that, mum can grab you harder and it'll still work. And that's what you need. She might also grab you in the arms rather than the wrists. It's exactly the same, exactly the same. Still grab your own hand and leave her out of it. And then do the other side. Straight away, get your hands up. That's it. Good stuff. Dang, come on. Face your parent or your partner. If you've got one, to yep. Kill it. And just come forward to the camera. Okay, now, as I was saying, this is why a lot of people do taekwondo, is to learn self-defense. It has to work. And that means a combination of technique and power. I say, for example, for the yellow belt releases, it's about getting the technical side of the release right and then using all of your body 
in your release. Don't try and just release with your arm because generally the person that grabs you is going to be bigger and stronger than you. So if you're just using your arm, it's not going to work. You have to use your whole body and then get your hands up to defend yourselves. We have, of course, A level and B level. Remember the principles from the book. In fact, I'm going to show you these now, although we'll cover them in more detail next class. These general principles. There are 11 principles to follow in your physical responses. And it's really important to understand these and to try and learn them. There's principles about the position of your body. So using, you don't try and, when you're free sparring, so don't be bouncing around when you're doing self-defense stuff. This is natural. Someone grabs you or someone attacks you and you respond quickly. Unless you walk around the street doing little bounces, then that's not very realistic, right? So you're just in a natural position. When you're free sparring, you're trying to create space and close space very quickly and mix the space up. In a self-defense scenario, whatever distance you're at, you want to be able to attack from there, whether you're close or far away. And if you're far enough away, you can turn and run. If it's safe to do so, you've got someone else you're looking after. The second thing about position, moving off the line, as Mr. West was talking about before, if an attack's coming straight towards you, you're going to shift slightly off the line and stay off the ground. You do not want to be on the ground in a self-defense situation. First thing, we're not grapplers. But the second thing is the ground is a very dangerous place to be in a self-defense situation because as we've assumed, they've got weapons and they've got friends. If you're on the ground grappling around with one opponent, their friends are going to come in and stomp on you. So get off the ground as quickly as you can if you end up there. So your position stuff. Respond. We do lots of beautiful fancy kicks and take more flying kicks, head height stuff, all that sort of thing. Am I actually sharing my screen or am I talking without sharing? I'm talking without sharing, aren't I? Talking without sharing. Okay, sorry. There we go. Now you can see what I'm talking about. Okay, so position, those first three. Respond, we've got lovely kicks in Taekwondo. We do head high kicks, we do all sorts of great stuff. In a self-defense situation, generally your kicks are always below the belt. Anytime you lift your leg up too high, you're at, a, at risk of throwing, being thrown off balance, of them flinching and blocking you and throwing off balance. So you tend to do your kicks low. If you can kick powerfully high, you can get a lot of power with low kicks. Go straight in for attack and don't telegraph. In Taekwondo, with our fundamental movements, we do a lot of relaxing and backward motion. One, two, three. One, two, three. This is just about learning how to develop power. When you're applying it for self-defense, you don't want to do that backward motion because it gives your opponent an opportunity to respond to it. You want to go straight from one hit into the next hit very quickly. Be fast with all of your responses. Lots of acceleration and keep it simple because under stress, you won't be able to think about fancy manipulations and stuff. So just strong, quick hits, they're the things that are going to be able to come to you. So then you respond stuff and then committing Always be thinking when someone's attacking you, what could come next? When they're grabbing you, what's the attack they could do? If they're grabbing my hand or my arm with one hand, the punch could come in. If they've got two hands on my lapel, it could be a head butt or a knee. So thinking about what those risks are and preparing for those. Use your body to generate power. We've talked, I've talked about that a lot. All of your self-defense stuff is all a lot about moving your body. And it's the same principles as sine wave and hip power that we use in patterns and everything else we do in Taekwondo. Fixing your opponent is once you've got your hands on them, if you keep hold of your opponent, you can feel where they are. Then you can look around for the next opponent while you're ripping this person up and making them less of a threat. Okay, so fixing your opponent's useful and following up. Hit, 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 hit. And you keep hitting until the danger's over. And then you stop. Okay, so they're your principles. So whenever you're, even when you're practicing, so as I say, I'd like you to be, working with a partner for this. So try and have somebody in your house that you can work with for 10 minutes each class because we'll be doing a little bit of this every class. When you have that person, you can work around moving, using those theories, using those principles, making sure that everything's effective. A-level stuff, the, only, the difference between A-level and B-level is what they're trying to do to you and the level of response that you do. It doesn't mean there's no power. A-level does not mean soft, although when you're inside with pictures and stuff around, of course, you've got to be very careful. You're not going to throw each other into walls, right? But generally, A-level does not mean soft. It just means they're not trying to, to kill you, for example, or not trying to, to gut you like a fish. So you've still got to be strong in your response. You just don't want to be causing a lot of harm. 
right? And then B level is when you're really going to look after yourself. And they're two extremes. So it could be anything in the middle. So you've got to practice to those appropriate levels. You should always have power in your techniques, but you should be able to control it and not hurt people if you need to be able to defend without hurting. Okay. So we're going to apply those things. The book, remember, has your starting point for all of your six grads, but it doesn't have a tail of 20 things to do. Because in reality, those sequences just don't tend to fit. Because the person might step forward and fall into you, or they might step back, or they might fall over. Things can change. So you have to be adaptable. Move, 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 move. What's my next target? What's my next target? And that's what I want you to be able to demonstrate at grading. So over the next few weeks, you must have a partner to work with. Do read the book to make sure you know the starting point of all of your defenses. Because with a group like this, that's yellow belt all the way through to black belt to red belts, I cannot say, here are the six red belt techniques, here are the six blue belt techniques. Right? So I need to be able to answer your questions rather than demonstrate everything for you. Does that make sense? Okay, so we're going to stretch off. I'll stay on for five minutes afterwards. For anybody who doesn't have the book and isn't sure about their defenses, I can show you through them briefly before you go. Okay, but otherwise, thank you very much, guys. Good work tonight. Let's get some stretching done, sitting down with your left leg out. If you've got any questions, feel free to unmute and ask while we're stretching. Now, if you just can't get a partner to work with you at home, let me know. It's not the end of the world. Uh, but, you know, it's, for me, it's a really important part of what we're trying to develop for you is your ability to defend yourself. And that doesn't happen in a mirror. Nate and Jess, I've got a great view of your ceiling tonight. Sorry I didn't mention that before. There we are. Awesome. And change sides. As I said before, to be eligible for grading, I expect you to be here regularly a couple of times a week uh, and with your camera on, because I can't give you feedback if your camera's not on. And I certainly can't grade you if I can't see you. So a couple of you that don't have working cameras, if you want to grade, then you might look at trying, getting a, trying to get a camera uh, so that you can add that to, to your training. And both legs out, switch up and forward. Can you just raise your hand for me again if you don't have a copy of the self defense handbook at home? Okay, one. Okay. So you might want to stay on for five minutes after class if you can, just to ask me some questions or for me to show you what the syllabus is, in case you're unsure of any of it. Heels in. And stretch. And turn to the side, legs in the air. Grab your trousers, open your legs up. If you want to do some extra training, you're absolutely welcome to come along as well as the Tuesdays and Thursdays at six. You're welcome to come along to the junior sessions on Mondays and Wednesdays at five, or the family class on Saturdays at 11. Uh, we'll do more junior stuff. It's good, worthwhile getting the practice. But alternatively, of course, we've got the recorded classes on our website, so you can go through or you can do your own training at your level.
Standing up. Left feet behind. Need. For those of you who are thinking about the grading, I'd like you to do a little bit of work on your camera angle and your positions in your house to make sure that when you are grading, I can see your whole body. I'll need to see your feet through your head. So you might need to do a little bit of work, just making sure that your camera is at an angle that everything can be seen. And relax, give your legs a shake. Turn the left and tidy up. Thank you very much, everybody. Hope you enjoyed class tonight. I had fun. I look forward to seeing you next class. And remember, if you've got any questions, stay on after class. Come on. Come on. Take a while. What's up? Thanks, guys. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks for coming, guys. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Sorry, we forgot to put our camera properly. <laughs> no problem. <laughs>